you're listening to the Garage Gardeners Radio Show, where we talk about extending the gardening season and pushing garden boundaries. We talk to creative gardeners and garden experts who share ideas about how to garden longer and grow plants you didn't think you could grow. Now, here are your hosts, the daughter and father duo, Emma Biggs and Stephen Biggs. Hey everyone, I'm Emma Biggs and thanks for hanging out with us today on the Garage Gardeners Radio Show. I'm a 14-year-old garden writer and speaker who loves growing tomatoes. I'm an extreme gardener who wants the garden season to never end. Hey everybody, I'm Stephen Biggs. I write and speak about the food chain, farms, food, and gardens. And I'm a fig pig. One of my favorite plants is the fig. I have lots of fig plants around my place here in Toronto and lots of other out-of-zone plants too. I love the challenge of pushing zone boundaries. Emma and I also think gardening is a great way to hang out together. And we're glad you're hanging out with us here today. Our show is all about extending the gardening season and pushing garden boundaries. Now talking about hanging out, I was lucky enough to hang out with my amazing younger brother Keaton this morning. And we put put together our straw bale driveway garden. If you want to know more about straw bale gardening... Go to stephenbiggs.ca, go to past episodes, and you can listen to our chat with Craig Hulier about straw bale gardening. Now, if you're wondering where we got the name, the Garage Gardeners, well, Dad and I use our garage to extend the growing seasons because I grow heat-loving crops like tomatoes and peppers on our garage rooftop, and Dad stores his dormant fig trees in the garage over the winter. It helps us extend the season and store plants over the winter. Now, very exciting news for me. As some of you might remember, last summer, I teamed up with my friend Ty from Pennsylvania to start a kids' gardening and cooking YouTube channel called From Dirt to Dishes. Now, we're making more episodes this summer, and I'm so excited, and we're at 99 subscribers. Please help us spread the word, inspire more kids about gardening and cooking, and I'd love to hit the 100 subscriber mark before we start filming this season. If you want to connect with us, you'll find me at stephenbiggs.ca and Emma at emmabiggs.ca. On Instagram, you can find us hanging out as Garage Gardeners. And if you're tomato crazy, be sure to visit Emma's Instagram where she hangs out as Emma Biggs underscore grows. Now, we're really excited about our lineup of guests today. Our first guest, Charlie Nardozzi from Vermont, will share lots of berry growing inspiration. And then in the second half of the show, Darren Sheriff joins us from South Carolina where he pushes garden boundaries by filling his yard with potted citrus and camellias. Now in every show, I have a tomato talk segment and Dad has his Bigs on Fig segment. Today you'll hear a chat that I had with Linda Crego, who is an amazing tomato expert and one of my mentors about compact tomato varieties and some other really neat varieties too. And in Bigs on Figs, you'll hear Dad's talk with Ross Ratty, a 27-year-old fig enthusiast near Philadelphia, about his top tips for figs in the spring. So our first guest today is Charlie Nardozzi from Vermont. And Charlie is an award-winning garden writer, speaker, and radio and TV personality. And we had the pleasure of meeting Charlie this past March when he was here in Toronto to speak at Canada Blooms. We had a fun day hanging out together. We visited the Allen Gardens Conservatory and then the St. Lawrence Market. And like us, Charlie loves growing edibles. In his latest book, Foodscaping, Practical and Innovative Ways to Create an Edible Landscape, he shares lots of great tips. And there's also more tips on his website, gardeningwithcharlie.com, as well as he has articles and videos. Now, let's start chatting. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Emma. How are you? Great, thanks. How are you? I'm doing very well. Well, I'm so excited to be talking about berries today because there's so many different types of edibles and berries are definitely one of my favorites. Yeah, so, berries are great. You know, I, I find a lot of vegetable gardeners, especially new be- vegetable gardeners, they do the vegetable gardening thing for a while. Then they want another challenge. They want to kind of take the next step. And berries are a great place to go to do that because they're easier than you think and they're perennials. So you get them year after year. Yeah. So I'm going to start by asking you about blueberries because someone had given us a few blueberry plants and they weren't doing too well. So what do we need to know about growing blueberries? So blueberries, um, there's a couple things you need to understand about them to really grow them properly. Uh, first of all, they want full sun. If you're going to get the most berry, any kind of berrying plant, 
Um, if you want to get the most production from them, you want to put them in full sun, which is six to eight hours of direct sun a day. The other thing about blueberries is that they like an acidic soil. So most of the soils, depending on where you are, of course, in the country and even in the world, um, most of the soils tend to be around neutral, which is seven on the pH scale. Sometimes it'll be a little al alkaline, a mm -hmm. little higher than that, and sometimes a little lower. But blueberries like it really low, like below five on the pH scale. So that's normally not the kind of pH you're going to have in most soils. So you're going to have mm -hmm. to add sulfur to reduce that pH to get it down to around five or lower so your blueberries will thrive. Now, it may sound like it's a hard thing to do, but it's actually really easy because you can buy either powdered or pelletized sulfur. Then in the spring, just sprinkle like a, a cup or two around each bush, work it into the soil a little bit, and that's really all you have to do. Okay. Besides that, keep them well watered, maybe give them a little fertilizer every year, an organic fertilizer. I'm an organic gardener, mm -hmm. so I always use an organic fertilizer with some compost, and keep them mulched. They really have very shallow roots, so if you can keep them mulched, that allows the soil to stay evenly moist so that they can take up the moisture, take up the nutrients, and then give you all those great berries. Okay. And if I wanted to grow them in containers, because I'm a little bit iffy about giving up my tomato space, what are some tips for growing them in containers? Well, yes, you can grow them in containers. And actually, there's a, a relatively new group out called Bushel and Berry. Bushel and Berry. Mm -hmm. And they have specialized in dwarf fruit plants. So oh. you can get varieties through them, such as blueberry glaze or perpetua which are small plants that fit really nicely in a, in a container. And they only get maybe a foot or so tall, nice mounding shape, and they give you the handfuls of, of blueberries. So the thing with blueberries in containers is you have to, first of all, figure out where you are as far as the winters go. Uh -huh. If you're in a northern climate where it gets really cold, like Toronto or Vermont, you're going to have to protect your uh, containers into the winter. If mm -hmm. you're in a warmer climate uh, further south in the United States or, or other areas where it doesn't freeze so much in the winter, then you can just leave them out year-round. They'll be fine. As far as the soil goes, you want to mix in some potting soil, a little compost. Um, you can put some uh, extra peat moss in if you like, but really you have to make sure you have some of that sulfur in there because the peat moss itself won't lower the pH enough. Uh, and then put your plants in there, the varieties you select. It's nice to get a couple different varieties so that they cross-pollinate better, yeah. so you get better production that way. And then, again, put them in full sun and keep them well watered. That's really the simple way to take care of them during the growing season. If okay. you're in a cold climate uh, in the fall or as it's starting to get towards winter, mm -hmm. then you're going to want to protect them. You want to put them somewhere where it doesn't get below freezing very much. So it could be a basement, it could be a, a garage like you and your dad have, mm -hmm. um, or any kind of place where it's not going to get down too much below freezing. Okay. And then just leave them there. Um, actually, what I've done with these uh, bushel and berry varieties is I actually brought them into the house and used them as a house plant because they're oh, kind of wow. cute. Huh. <laughs> they're nice and round. They don't take up much space. Wow. And by March or so, they started flowering for me. I and want fact, a blueberry plant in my bedroom. So, and then I put them back outside, and they started producing fruit. So they're a pretty versatile plant, and there are, you know, in different places, evergreen blueberries. So it's not uncommon for them to be evergreen um, for 12 months of the year. I was just wondering about that. So do you get any sort of leaf drop as you transition them to the house, or do they hang on to most of their leaves? They did drop some of the lower leaves or the internal leaves that didn't get as much light, but we have a nice sunny room on the south side of our house, and that's where we put them, and they didn't really have much of a transition. They seemed to not skip a beat. And, you know, through the winter, the darker months of November till February, they just kind of stood there and just kind of hung on, you might say. Um, but once the days started getting longer, they started putting on some new growth and some flowers, too. Wow. Now, yeah. a question for you, Charlie, about the sulfur. Is that something you find it's best to do every year, or is it the sort of thing that you do every two or three years? I usually do it every year because um, often when I've tested the pH of my soil, I'm still kind of a little high. I'm still up in the fives for my blueberries. And mm -hmm. you can tell, too, if you're not getting your pH low enough for blueberries. You can look at the leaves. And if you get what we call intervenal chlorosis, it's not a disease. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a syndrome, which basically means that the veins stay green, but in between the veins uh, turn kind of a yellow color. That mm. means that the plant is not taking up enough iron. And I know you've written a book on citrus. You probably know about that, and not yes. taking up enough iron and how the leaves will get affected. Uh, so um, what you'll have to do is lower the pH so that iron in the soil becomes more available. So that's one way to tell if you're putting down enough of the sulfur or not, is if the leaves are looking nice and green and not getting these yellowing in between the veins, then you're doing okay. Um, but I usually put it down once a year just to be on the safe side. 
Okay. That's good. Well, let's jump to raspberries because okay. um, that's a favorite around our household. We've got black raspberries, purple raspberries. And our absolute favorite is the fall gold golden raspberries. Oh, yeah. Those are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are some of your top raspberry tips? Oh, so raspberries, uh, it's, a big, it's a big topic. As you're seeing, that there's lots of different types out there. But I think the ones that most people are interested in are the red and the gold. Mm -hmm. of raspberries and the thing to remember with raspberries is you can get two different kinds now so you can get the traditional july bearing if you're in a northern area around july or southern areas more towards june um, bearing raspberries summer bearing raspberries or you can get what we call the ever bearing raspberries and these are the ones that will produce in the summer as well as the fall mm -hmm. and so depending upon which kind you have you will treat them a little bit differently so if you say have the um, a caroline or, or some of the ever-bearing um, red raspberries that are out there, um, they will have the first cane that comes up is called the prima cane, the first year cane, mm -hmm. and that grows through the season. Now normally that cane would just stay green and, and not do anything, and then it would go through the winter, and then the second year it would produce its fruit. But on the ever-bearing varieties, like the ones I'm mentioning, um, those actually produce fruit the first year, um, usually towards the late summer, early fall, and so it's a <coughs> September, so, <coughs> excuse me. And then um, what they'll do is they'll overwinter, and then they'll produce a second crop on the same cane that mid that summer. So you get two crops from one cane, which is kind of a fun thing to have. Mm -hmm. Now, I often get questions of people like, how do I prune my red raspberries or my gold raspberries? And the simplest thing to tell them is that you prune them in the summer after they've uh, produced. So any of the canes that produce in the summer, you prune them off because they're going to die anyway. So that would be the simplest thing to do without having to do any other pruning. It's just really easy to see where you pick the, the berries from, see which canes those are. They'll have a different color of the bark, too. By that time, they'll start getting more of a grayish mm -hmm. kind of color to them. And just cut them off at the ground. Now, if you want to do something a little different, what some of the commercial growers will do is that they will just want to have a big fall crop. So what they'll do is this time of year, in the spring, they'll just mow the whole thing down. And what that does, it takes out all the canes that overwintered, mm -hmm. but it leaves a lot of room for the new ones to come up that are going to produce fruit for them in the fall. Mm -hmm. So that way they get a big fall crop, but they don't get a summer crop. So it's mm -hmm. kind of fun you know, playing around with it. You can do a little bit of each. That's kind of what I do sometimes. Mm -hmm. Cut some of them down, leave some of them going. Um, but making sure you get those berries um, from summer to fall. Yeah, yeah. I think we need some ever-bearing ones because the amount of raspberries that we eat is unbelievable we grow them in the same day someone has picked them from the garden and sometimes it's hard to figure out who with five people in the family emma's looking at her little brother <laughs> it could be your brother that's what i'm yeah. guessing but yeah it happens at our house too we uh, rarely have raspberries that come into the house it's kind of like the figs you know see with the yeah yeah, just yeah. There. you just stand there and just eat them <laughs> yeah keaton's sitting in the chair and he's looking pretty guilty yeah <laughs> uh. Hey, well, we have an um, email question here from Brenda, okay. and she's just asking uh, whether the advice also holds true for strawberries, and maybe that's a, a good um, segue into uh, talking about strawberries now. Sure. Yeah, we could definitely talk about strawberries. So um, part of that is true in the sense that there are now ever-bearing varieties, or they call them also day-neutral varieties of strawberries. So uh, like the raspberries, there used to be where you have your strawberries, they would produce for two or three weeks, depending on how many different varieties you have, and then they'd be done. But now with these other varieties, they end up producing right through the summer, even into the fall. So if you want to extend your season, that's really the way to go. And mm -hmm. there's some great day-neutral varieties out there. Uh, Seascape is one. Um, EV2 is another one. Tribute. There's a number of different varieties that are out there that do really well. And the way to grow your strawberries is, of course, you put them on a raised bed. And if you're planting them now uh, for this year, um, if you're growing just the regular ones that produce in the summer, you're not going to get a crop this year. You want to pinch off all the flowers. So you plant your plants, let them grow up. If they start flowering, pinch off the flowers because you want to get that root system really well established. Right. And, yeah. And then uh, next year is when you start getting berries from them. But if you use these day-neutral varieties, what you can do is you plant them now, you pinch off the flowers until about July 1st, and then you leave them and let them set flowers for the fall. So you actually will get a, a crop in the fall the first year, and then, of course, subsequent crops uh, the next year, starting in the summer and then kind of producing to the fall. Okay. okay. Now I'm just thinking, last year we bought some strawberry plants because before that, 
uh, we had a strawberry patch in the vegetable garden and it started taking over. And without my consent, dad dug the whole thing up and threw it in the compost pile. So we got some new ones last year and we put it into our, we planted them in the back garden and then the squirrels kept digging them up. But it looks like they're starting to come back. So I'm really excited for our strawberries. We have a oh, new nice. uh, strawberry, and I don't remember the name, but it's a white-colored uh, strawberry. Have Have you ever um, heard about those, Charlie, or seen people try yeah, them? Yeah, there's these full-size strawberries that are white with and the seeds, because of those little things, those little dots on the strawberry are the seeds. Those are red, so it's kind of a cool color. I think it's called Sweet Caroline is the name mm. of the variety. Okay. And uh, it's kind of a, a fun uh, strawberry to grow for that reason. The other group that's really fun to grow are the alpine strawberries. Mm-hmm. And if you're really uh, cramped for space, because I know you guys have already gardened every inch of your property, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have room for anything else, these are nice because they're bunching. They don't send out runners, and they stay in little bunches so they can fit in a container, in a window box, places like that. And you can get not only red varieties like Alexandria, but you can get yellow and white varieties like Yellow Wonder. Mm. And that's really cool, not only because they taste a little different, they have kind of a more uh, fruity taste to them, Mm -hmm. um, but also I found that the squirrels and the chipmunks and the birds don't seem to care for them. Mm. Whether the color is different, so they're not used to eating a white fruit, or they don't like the flavor, but for me, they haven't really uh, bothered them as much as the other red berries. Wow. Well, I have a strawberry plant, and I think I grew it from seed, but it's doing well and it's in container and it's uh, kind of clumping like that. It doesn't sp- it doesn't send out runners and so it must be an alpine strawberry. But I'm excited to hear that there's yellow strawberries because I've never heard of that before. Yeah, and they're, they're like I said, they have a little different flavor to them. A little more. I think one is actually called pineapple. So you can imagine sitting on a sunny beach mm. eating a pineapple while you're eating yeah. a strawberry. That's what you can get. Now we just have an email in from Carla, and she's asking if you'll be on a garden, if you're doing a garden bus tour this year, and if so, anywhere near Syracuse in New York. Oh, <laughs> well, she knows about my bus tour. That's very nice. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are doing a garden bus tour this year. It's something I've been doing every summer with a former uh, professor, horticultural professor at the University of Vermont, Leonard Perry, mm-hmm. and he and I have been leading a tour, usually in the northeast of the United States, uh, sometimes up into Canada. We've gone up to the Montreal area, up towards Ottawa before. Okay. Um, but this year we're going down to Connecticut, so we're not going towards Syracuse at all, um, unfortunately. Oh. We're going to see the Historic Gardens of Connecticut, and we'll be down there um, from July 15th to the 17th. And uh, right now, as, as of right now, we only have a waiting list for that because it fills up pretty quickly. Uh, oh, wow. People like to go on our trips. Now, if people um, want if to know want more? To find out more about it for next year, definitely sign up for the newsletter. Okay. And that's on your website, gardeningwithcharlie.com, I think, right? Yes, exactly. And the first page that comes up, it'll be an option to sign up for the newsletter. Okay. Well, let's jump to honeyberries because uh, we're getting towards the end of our segment, but we that's one of our favorites, and we really want to ask you about honeyberries. And So what, what can you share with listeners about honeyberries and, and what to know well, about them? Yeah, honeyberries are a fun new fruit that's out there. They're in the honeysuckle family, Mm -hmm. Um, and unlike the Japanese uh, honeysuckle and some of the other more invasive ones, these I haven't seen any evidence in my yard or from other people that they are invasive. So that's a nice thing to know right off the bat. You're not going to be introducing uh, an exotic invasive into your yard. They're from Siberia, so they're really hardy. I mean, like the winter never touches these guys. And when I first bought them... uh, a bunch of years ago, I bought a mail order, and I got these two little sticks in the mail. <laughs> thought, okay, this is not going to grow. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I put them in anyway, and lo and behold, they survived the first year, grew up about a foot tall. Second year, they grew about two feet tall, and they produced a ton of these purple, bur- <laughs> purple uh, cylindrical-shaped berries that kind of have a flavor like a wild grape, wild blackberry. And and the shrubs are really beautiful. They're small. They're round. They kind of remind me of some of those dwarf spireas that are mm-hmm. out in the market now. Mm-hmm. So it's nice looking even after it produces fruit. And the best thing about it is it produces its fruit two weeks before strawberries. So if you're looking to extend your fruiting season, this is a nice early crop to get. Uh, right now, mine are flowering already. So they're getting ready to, to start produce again. Okay. And have you tried them in containers or are you growing them in the ground? I'm growing those in the ground, so I haven't tried them in containers, but I would think they'd be a good candidate, uh, because uh, especially if you can get some of the smaller varieties. I think I have Blue Moon and Blue Velvet. 
Um, and you do need to have two different varieties for cross-pollination, whether it be in a container or in the ground. Uh, but they'd be good candidates for container growing, I think. Okay. I should mention, and we've been enjoying honeyberries too, and good. I know they're ripe when I see the robins darting in and out of the bushes. They seem to love them. Mm-hmm. And yes, the uh, cedar waxwings too. We do have to cover ours with netting, or, or those cedar waxwings come, as you know, in droves, so they mm-hmm. would just clean off the bushes. Yeah, they're one of those things that we take out a bowl to harvest them when the bowl comes in empty because we've eaten them all in the garden. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the dogs and I like to eat them. We sit down by the bush, and I eat some, and they're eating them, and everyone's really happy. Hmm. Um, do you grow any mulberries where you are? I do. I have a mulberry tree, um, just a traditional uh, mulberry, and it's been producing for years, actually. And that's one I usually don't bother trying to net or trellis. I let the birds take whatever they want, and there's so many of them that I usually get a handful here and there, too. Mm. Um, and actually, that's a nice thing to do if you have bird problems on some of your other berries is to grow a mulberry and put it on the other side of your yard, or better yet, give it to your neighbor to plant. Because <laughs> <laughs> huh? all the birds that go over there, they love mulberries, and they may not be as interested in your blueberries or your strawberries. That's a great idea. I, I love, love mulberries. They're one of my all-time favorite fruits, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, they're great. They're so sweet, and they just like, eat them by the handfuls. and. I have started to get a little more uh, jealous of the birds, and so last year I put some netting just on a couple branches, some of the lower branches, just so I can have something every time I walk by just to grab a handful or so. Mm. Wow. Well, Charlie, we're getting to the time where we need to finish up, and I'd like to thank you for all the great berry-growing information you've shared with us today. Well, it's been nice that you've had me on. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Thank you very much. much. Okay, we hope we'll have you on again. Yes, I'm happy to come on anytime. Okay. Bye, Charlie. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. That was Charlie Nardozzi, and Charlie's latest book is Foodscaping, Practical and Innovative Ways to Create an Edible Landscape. And you can visit Charlie's website for articles, and he has videos, too. So you go to gardeningwithcharlie.com. Now we're moving on to the part of the show where I get to talk about my favorite plant, tomatoes. Today you'll hear a chat that I had with Linda Crego, who is one of my tomato mentors. I was at a gardening event this spring, and I was lucky enough to have a table next to her where she had some trays of a compact little, uh, of compact little tomato plants. Now, I thought it'd be fun to look at compact tomato plants because not everyone has the space for full-size tomato plants, and we're also going to mention some other really neat varieties that I'm so excited to grow this summer. So here's my chat with Linda Crego. So Linda's on the line with me now to talk about tomatoes. Hey, Linda. Hey, how are you, Emma? Pretty good. Excited to be talking about tomatoes. Of course. Yeah, so my first question was about the house tomato. Now, when I saw you at a CD Saturday, I got two really beautiful house tomato plants from you. And can you tell our listeners what's so special about the house tomato? Well, it's a pretty pretty neat little plant. They don't grow very tall at all. Maybe you know, a foot, possibly a little bit more. It's actually an indeterminate plant, so it doesn't doesn't grow very big, but it continues to blossom and produce fruit all season, which is sort of uh, the definition of an indeterminate plant. So it's, uh, it's a great little plant, and the idea, and of course tomatoes, in our climate, we consider them annuals, but um, in other climates, they're, they're certainly not. They're perennials. They don't... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so the neat thing about the house tomato is at the end of the season, you can bring it in. You know, it, it'll look scraggly, no question about it. Cut it cut it back a little bit and then put it in a, you know, a really nice south-facing window. Um, give it a little bit of kelp fertilizer and it'll survive all, all winter. Reasonably uh-huh. dormant, but you, you may get, you know, a tomato or two here or there. Um, and then it, and at the end of the winter, uh, you, you know, harden it off. Take it outside again in the spring, and, and uh, there you go. You're yeah. off to the race. Well, I'm really so. excited to try that because I grew a house tomato that I got from you last year in the garden, but I didn't bring it inside. And so this year, I want to try that because, you know what, I love tomatoes, and if I can get them in the winter, that's just amazing. Yeah, and the, the thing about this plant is the tomatoes are very good. Like, they're they're really sweet and they're prolific they're just little round red cherry tomatoes but they're 
really, really delicious. So, I mean, that, that's why we grow so much, right? Yeah. Because of the plant. So, yeah, so that, that's the bonus. It's funny, I, you know, the, the house tomato, it's a very old tomato. It, it's, uh, it's actually Russian. And uh, the, it first came over to North America, to Saskatchewan. In, in the late 1800s. So it's a variety that's been around for years and years. And uh, and some people, like, have really, you know, grown them year, year you know, year round. And uh, the, the, the fellow who uh, has the longest living one, is, it's been 12 years. Wow. <laughs> so well, that's pretty cool. I'm going to start mine this year, the ones that you started. And I'm going to try and keep them as long as I can now. Yeah. Problem it, it, is, it, I'm it, bad with house plants. I kill them very quickly. Well, yeah, but <laughs> let, let's be real here. I mean, this is a tomato. It's different. Yeah. Tomatoes are yeah. definitely different. Yeah. 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 So there you go. Yeah. Well, I was wondering if there's other compact varieties that you've grown or heard of that are kind of like the house tomato. Well, I mean, there, there, there's sort of, you know, there's every, you know, every type of tomato is that you can imagine, of course, there are some that are that I've grown that are like actually mini dwarfs, so they're much much smaller than the house tomato. They, you know, some of them, for example, the micro tom, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. I've grown some little yellow ones too. They only grow honestly no more than you know two or three inches high. Wow. So, and possibly, you know, I don't know, with with the fully leaved, maybe you know four inches in diameter. So they're very small. So. You could certainly do the same thing with them, but I find with them the tomatoes just aren't quite as tasty. They're they're drier, um, okay. and they and they struggle a little bit more, I think, health wise, um, because they're so close to the they're so close to the soil. But mm. um, yeah, to, to to my way of thinking, the house is is kind of unique. But I mean, you certainly could bring any tomato plant in in the fall. And I've I've done just that. I've had um, well this this winter I brought a sun gold in, and of course it's a very large variety. But mm-hmm. um, but I uh, yeah I overwintered it and I cut it back. It's in my greenhouse now. You can, and I've done it with yellow pear. And oh. you will get it's the same thing. You'll still get you know you'll get a little bit of fruit, not a whole ton, but you can certainly overwinter all the plants. Um, but the house is certainly you know the easiest. Yeah. Because of you know otherwise you end up with a you know jungle in your living room window which yeah I'm really excited to try some of well I grew house and I'm going to overwinter it now and I now I'm excited about the micro dwarfs which you uh were talking a bit about and I've heard that there may be starting a breeding project to breed a few more so I'm excited I want to find out more about that but I was also wondering if you could tell our listeners about the stick tomato because you were talking about it uh, when I heard you fa- your fabulous presentation about tomatoes at a CD Saturday, and I just think it's the coolest thing ever, and so I'm so excited to grow it. But could you let them know what it is, the stick tomato? Oh, stick! Oh, it's hilarious. It's um, yeah, it, it's a really bizarre variety. Um, you, you know, there are all kinds of bizarre tomatoes, but this is actually a very bizarre plant. So the plant um, is basically a stick. The stem. Um, doesn't have like um, branches that leaf out. It just has sort of little rosettes of leaves all the way up the stem. So it's basically a stick with these little bunches of leaves all the way up the stem, and that's actually where the blossoms and the tomatoes form as well. So it, it, it's it's really you know it's really different. It's um, um, like I don't because I have a lot of space. I don't I don't stake my tomatoes, but. That when you really have to, or it just flops, like it just is a stick that you know not far enough in the ground and it just falls over. It gets very top heavy when the tomatoes form, and again they're just little, you know, they're little red cherry tomatoes, and they're they're tasty. You don't get a ton of them. Um, it's one of those tomatoes that's really like <clears throat> like it's like a novelty tomato. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some that are just. There's one I have on my list of tomatoes this year, and it's. Uh, it's called Long John, and it's another novelty tomato. And when people order it, I kind of, I always tell them, if you're expecting, like, a ton of tomatoes from this, it's like, don't, because it's, you know, it's just a real oddity again. Um, and it's uh, it's like a very, very skinny tomato with a little bulb on the end. Like, I oh. mean, <laughs> it, it, it's really a bizarre one, too. But it, it's huh. fun to grow. 
it's very compact and uh yeah it's it's a pretty neat little one so yeah there's all kinds of all kinds of interesting things out there when you start really doing your research so yeah Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm really excited about, though, is your tomato plant sale, because that's where I'm going to get a plant for the stick tomato, and I may even get a couple more house tomato plants. Can you tell our listeners a bit about your tomato plant sale? Because it is the best place that you can go for tomato plants. Oh, aren't you sweet? It's um, I, I start selling um, on the long weekend in May, so it, this year it's May 18th. So I open up at 8. Um, I have... Probably, I haven't actually really counted. I'm just going to sit down now and do up the list of all the tomatoes I have so people have a sense of what's here, but probably around 500 or so, maybe a little bit more varieties of tomatoes. Um, wow. A couple, yeah, most of them are heirlooms. There are quite a few that are open pollinated varieties. So I have a good selection of lo- uh, a lot of the different blues. I have, um, and then I have all, all the other vegetables too, um, mostly pretty much all heirlooms, peppers, eggplants. Okay. Everything you can imagine. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've picked up some amazing stuff from Linda's tomato plant sale. I remember last year I got some of the blue shoulder tomatoes, and that was just the highlight of my year. Yeah. Yeah. There's some There's some pretty, pretty neat ones, and I've got a whole pile of different ones that I'm trialing this year in my garden. But, you know, if I like them, then they'll end up, at, um, there'll be plants for them next year, too. So, because, they're, you know, you just never run out of different ones to try. Yeah, that's so, that's why tomatoes are so amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. well, thanks so much for talking to me, Linda. I'm so excited, and I'm so excited to be at, to be going to your tomato plant sale, and I'm to grow the stick tomato and more house tomatoes and some more micro dwarfs, so thank you. Well, thank you very much, and I'll okay. look forward to seeing you then. Yeah, okay. Bye, Linda. Again, that was Linda Crago, one of my mentors, talking about the house tomato and a few other really neat tomato varieties. Linda runs the Tree and Twig Heirloom Vegetable Farm in Niagara, Canada, and one of my highlights every year is visiting Linda for her Tomato Days plant sale on the May Long Weekend. It's packed with people that she's inspired and gotten excited about tomatoes, and of course, There's hundreds of varieties of unusual tomato plants. Now, this year, it's the May 18th, 19th, and 20th, and you can find more at treeandtwig.squarespace.com. Now, our next guest is Darren Sheriff, who goes by the name The Citrus Guy. And Darren's a garden writer, educator, and speaker in South Carolina, where he fills his yard with 55 varieties of citrus, all in containers. And Darren says that the neighbors know him as the weirdo plant freak, but that they must approve because some of them let him use their yards for his plants. Now, I met Darren when I was looking for citrus experts to talk to for my book, Grow Lemons Where You Think You Can't, and I found Darren's book, a really inspiring book called How to Grow Citrus Practically Anywhere. And his approach to gardening really is inspiring. Darren will tell us about his other gardening passion too, Camellias. He is the president of the Coastal Carolina Camellia Society, and Dad got his first three camellias this past winter. Guess what? He's already killed one of them. And so you can, if you want to know more about this, keep listening, and you can find Darren online at www.thecitrusguy.com. Okay, well, let's chat with Darren. Hi, Darren. Hi, Stephen. How's it going? Going well. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Well, maybe we should start out by getting you to tell our listeners a bit about all the different plants that you have in your yard. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned the, all the citrus that I've got. I've got 220 camellias, uh, 13 different types of figs. I've got tropical fruit that a lot of people have never heard of, like Jacoba Jatokaba. Got to even say it. Uh-huh. Uh, some mulberry trees, some juju, jujubes. Um, I just, I've got a whole bunch of little bit of everything. Oh, you're making me hungry, and I haven't even heard that much yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I do grow, and, and I overheard your conversation a little while ago with the uh, lady with the tomatoes and stuff. I do play around with some tomatoes every so often and hot peppers and things like that. So. Oh, nice. wow. Well, now, how did you get into citrus, and, and how did you become the citrus guy? <laughs> 
it, it's actually kind of a funny story. The uh, wife and I were at a grocery store one year, right around Christmas time. It was either just before or just after. And there was this little, we walked through the florist section, there was this little Calamundin, which is a kumquat hybrid. Mm-hmm. It was like 50% off, half the shrub was dead, it had one or two little pieces of fruit on it. It, it was really a sad-looking plant. And she said, oh, you should get that. I said, no, I don't have time for anything like that, because at the time I was growing a lot of cactus and succulents. Mm-hmm. I said, no, we don't need anything like that. She said, but the poor thing needs a home for the holiday. I said, no. She said, oh, come on. I, she regrets those words. <laughs> After the key, that was the Calamunda, my second one was a key line. And then after that, I have no idea what happened. At one time, I had 109 different varieties in the yard. Wow. And then I got into the camellias, and it was like, "Mm, okay, I think I need to whittle down the camellias or the uh, citrus a little bit. Mm. But I I picked up the name uh, when I became a master gardener back in 2007. Mm. And when, you know, they had everybody stand up and, and introduce themselves and talk a little bit. And I mentioned that I had grown citrus and... Every time anybody had a citrus question of all of any kind, they would say, "Hey, go ask that citrus guy over there." So <laughs> I took the name and ran with it. Oh wow! <laughs> and and now people know you far and wide as the citrus guy. I think that's amazing. Well, uh, yeah, I, and I'll tell you what: with the age of the internet, I mean, it's just amazing the amount of questions that I get. Matter of fact, I was just talking to a guy the other day in Australia hmm. that had a citrus question. It's like. Wow, I mean, I don't even know what your growing zone is or anything else like that, but he had questions for me, so I answered them best I could. Wow. And so now you've whittled down your collection considerably because you said you had 109, and what, you're around the 55 mark now, I think, right? Correct. That's correct. Okay. And do you have, what are your, some of your favorites? If, if someone is just thinking about getting into citrus, what do you normally tell them to start out with? It usually it will depend on how much of a research they want to get into because some of the some of the varieties that I really really like are a little bit harder to find. Usually, what I'll tell people to start with is like uh, the Satsuma tangerine mandarins, okay, something like an Owari or a pumpkin or something along those lines. My absolute favorite is called a seedless kishu, K I S H U. Okay. And the only place that I know of that you can get one of those, and I'm sure you've probably heard of Logies in mm. Connecticut. Yes. Oh, yeah. L- Logies has some really cool stuff, and they sell the seedless kishu. Mm. If anybody really wants a, I mean, just a top-notch, absolutely drop-dick, gorgeous tangerine that's really good to eat, get that one. Okay. I've never heard of that, and now I think I need to go shopping. Oh, no. Yes, you do. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll tell you what, it really lives up to its name. Um, the wife and I have eaten, oh, I mean, it's, it's got to be anywhere from 100 or more fruit. Neither one of us have ever found a seed in it. I mean, not even one. Wow. So it lives up to its name of seedless kishu. And with your citrus, is there a certain size uh, container that you aim to grow them in? How how big are the pots and containers you're using? Uh, the biggest pots that I use, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm manager of a garden center, so I mean, I can get all the pots and everything that I've always, you know, I can ever use. Mm-hmm. I usually keep them in about tray 15 or 30 gallon pots. Once they start getting bigger than that, it's a little bit harder to move them around if it does get really cold. Like, you know, the, the winter of 2018 here, the winter that shall not be spoken of, Mm. You know, we don't usually have ice and snow and 18 degrees and stuff like that for a week in Charleston, but we did that year. So it's easier to protect them if they're in a 15 or a 30-gallon pot. Okay. And you do that neat thing where you have a tangle of citrus on your lawn and you just blanket them with with things. Um, I do. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, I've been telling people for years, you know, you can wrap Christmas lights around uh, and put a plastic sheeting or whatever over it. But a lot of times you end up breaking the branches or if the trees get too tall or whatever. What I did back in the 2018 winter, I literally laid them down on the ground, kind of crisscrossed them over a little bit, and then I threw like a frost cloth and a, a crochet blanket and a tarp and anything that I could find I just kind of laid over them, kind of wished them luck. Three weeks later, when I stood them up, 
they looked like they had come out of a greenhouse. Mm. I was literally eating the kumquats off the one tree because it still had fruit on it, and they were absolutely fine. Wow. Basically, the mm. gist of it is you want to keep it, you don't have to have it as a tropical paradise in there. Keep it at or just above freezing. Of okay. course, down here, our ground doesn't freeze solid, so that, you know, that's usually not a problem here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're a little bit envious of the, the climate there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are what? Probably about forty-five degrees today. It's cold. Yeah, yeah. We're zone five, and uh, well, we had snow yesterday too. So, yeah. Ooh, yeah. that's a four-letter word. It is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, what about the citrus in the kitchen? Uh, are you making marmalade, juice? What are some of your favorite things to do with them? Um, a little bit of everything. Uh, I use the. Um, well, and I'll tell you what, like kumquats and the calamundins, which is, of course, the, the kumquat hybrid, the, um, those make a phenomenal marmalade. Mm. You know, a lot of people like using the sour oranges and things like that for marmalade. I don't like that kind, uh-huh. but the, the calamundin and kumquat marmalade is phenomenal. Okay. You can also use calamundins in place of your lemon. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, any of your recipes for, call for lemon juice, use calamundin. I make a killer calamundin meringue pie. Wow. Uh, sounds I, so I know good. y'all are getting hungry again, right? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I mean, I use them for, you know, different cookies. I've made key lime cookies, you know, with the juice and a little bit of the zest. Oh. Um, I use it like on uh, chicken, mm-hmm. you know, the lemon and the uh, mm. some of the, the tangerines make a really interesting uh, sauce for chicken. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, for my birthday last year, Dad got me a kumquat tree, and so I'm so happy about it, and the fruits are going to be ready soon. So it looks like I have some cooking to do. Oh, good. What, yeah. Which uh, kumquat did you get, Meal or Nagami? Nagami. Nagami? Okay, cool. The, the oblong, the longer yeah, ones. Yeah, they're cool. beautiful little fruit. Yeah. Well, I promised I, I, Emma I wouldn't hog this segment with all citrus because she wants to find out how not to kill the other two camellias. <laughs> we well, and I was going to say, I, I overheard in the introduction that you had already, and you had sent me a, a message saying that you've already killed one of your camellias. How did you do that, Steve? What I, did you do? I don't know what I did, but we need your help. Give us the lowdown on what we should be doing for our camellias. Uh, let's see. For you guys up there, it's going to be a little bit different because your full sun's not as hot as ours. Are you talking Sasanquas or Japonicas? I don't even know. That's how little I know about camellias. <laughs> when, when were they supposed to bloom? They're, two of them are blooming right now. The two that are alive. And the dead <laughs> one is just a couple of sticks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if they're blooming right now, they're japonicas. Because those are your winter bloomers. Okay. Um, and you'll have to send me pictures of them. I can probably tell you what the names of them are. But okay. um, basically... And I'm, I'm going to kind of go out on a limb a little bit here because, like I said, I don't know your growing zone quite as much as mine. Mm-hmm. They definitely need dappled morning sun. Try to keep a little bit of afternoon shade. Keep your soil about the consistency of a wrung-out dish sponge. Mm-hmm. And do you protect yours during the winter, or is it – because I'm sure it's way too cold up there. Yeah, for they're them. in a cold greenhouse, so it gets down just above freezing. Okay, yeah, so you're fine then. Mine can handle, you know, mine handle down to 18 degrees, so that's no problem. Okay. Um, feed them. What? I'm sure you can get like holly tone up there. You've heard of that? Is that an acid type fertilizer? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Espoma puts it out. It's called holly tone. I don't know if you can get it in Canada or not. I haven't seen it. You might it. be able. To, any any type of acidic fertilizer is going to work. Okay. Uh, you would want to start feeding it right after the new flush of growth starts. Mm-hmm. And then feed it about every 45 days or so. Okay. Okay. And what size pots do you get yours up to? Because the ones that I was given, I think um, they're 8 or 10-inch or pots maybe. And uh, But I'm not sure how, how much I should pot them up. What do you normally do? Uh, all of mine are in either 7, 15, or 30-gallon trade pots. You know, the, the uh, landscape trade pots. Um, mm. If yours is in that size, yours is probably probably about a three gallon. How big are the plants? Plants are maybe uh, no more than knee high. 
bullpen. They they should be all right in those pots for a while longer. I would go ahead and put them up into a bigger, um, you know, a bigger pot. Mm-hmm. I would say probably at least a seven. Okay. And then just any the, – usually what I tell people about potting soils and stuff like that, there's three things that you need to remember about potting soil. Mm-hmm. One, that it is well-draining, you know, so it doesn't hold water real well. Right. But you also want it to be able to retain some moisture. So mm-hmm. my, my running gist is – Sand, you can't grow it in straight sand because, it yes, it is draining, but it's not going to support any water. Yes. You can't grow in straight peat moss because that would retain too much water and doesn't drain real well. Mm. The third thing to remember is it's got to be sturdy enough to support the plant. Right. So you can't grow it in, like, straight perlite. Mm-hmm. But a combination of all three is golden. Okay. So a peat, sand, perlite. And are yeah, you peat, using peat, a sand, perlite, and even so, a little bit of pine bark will help? You know, like the, the super shredded pine bark. Okay. Now you said something a little bit earlier that jumped out at me because it was such a great way to describe it. You said to have the soil a little bit like a wrung out dishcloth in terms of moisture. That's a correct. I love I love the way you describe that because sometimes it's hard to explain how much to water something. And that, that is the hardest thing to teach people. Um, you know, here at the garden center, that that is the toughest thing to, to teach people, whether to overwater it, underwater it, you know, whatever the case may be. So I, most people understand, you know, with the age of dishwashers nowadays, most people don't even know what a sponge is. But anyway, that's the thing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, if you tell them, you know, just think of a, a sponge that's been soaked in water, you wring it out, and then you just feel that sponge. That's the consistency you're looking for. And that goes for... You know, ninety percent of the plants. You know, cactus and succulents would be one of the few that it wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have a knack for overwatering succulents, and Dad has a knack for forgetting to water stuff. So we're kind of opposites that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'll tell you what. My very, very first plants that I got were some cactuses or cacti, however you want to say it. Mm-hmm. And I learned at a very early age what root rot was. Uh, I literally at times was watering cactuses like two and three times a day. Okay. Okay. But I mean, I was like, you know, eight years old or whatever. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So, <laughs> so, oh, no, I know plants need water, so I'd be watering them, you know, a couple times a day. And it's like, oh, why did they die? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, with with camellias, what do you find uh, are some of the top problems? What What is it that causes people like me to kill the camellias? What are people doing that... <laughs> that's most problematic, do you find? I would probably end up having to see, you know, how quickly it died or how long you had had it before it died. I mean, and I, I'm, I'm going to throw you a lifesaver here for a second, Stephen. Mm-hmm. It may not have been you that killed the camellia. How long did you have it for? I had it for maybe two months, I think. Oh, now see, that's a real good possibility that you did not kill it. It may not have been that healthy of a plant. Ah, uh, okay. So don't feel bad. I've actually got one right now that I just got about two weeks ago, and it's not looking real good right now, and I treat it the same way as I do everything else. So don't feel bad. It may not have been you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Emma's um, kind of relentless. Aww. Between that and the rosemary that I kill every year, she's pretty hard on me. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Rosemary is one of those plants that you can, you can either grow it like a nobody's weed or you will kill it just by looking at it. <laughs> I mean, rosemary is one of those things that I have issues with, too. And I grow exotic fruits and vegetables and you know, all that stuff. So, again, don't feel bad about the rosemary. Okay. It's okay. Well, thank you. Um, getting back to your original question, I would say probably things like tea scale would be the number one pest. Okay. And that's basically, if you look on the underside of the leaf, you'll see a whole bunch of little white. It almost looks like somebody's... Um, taken snow flock and and uh done the underside of the leaves you can use neem oil on that mm-hmm. only other possibility would be overwatering. they're fairly drought tolerant so i mean if, if your daughter overwaters and you underwater <laughs> you probably should take care of the camellias okay <laughs> yeah that sounds like a good plan yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay uh. 
Now, Darren, we're getting to the time where I need to finish up, but thank you, because it looks like Dad's now going to be taking care of the camellias, and I may <laughs> maybe I should take over with all the citrus now. But thank you for all the amazing information that you've shared with us and for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me, and if you all ever have any questions, you all know how to get a hold of me. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Darren. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Folks. You all have a good day. You too. That was Bye. Darren Sheriff, who goes by the name The Citrus Guy. He is a garden writer, educator, and speaker in South Carolina, and he fills his yard with 55 varieties of citrus. Find Darren, his gardening tips, and his book online at www.thecitrusguy.com. Well, this is the part of the show where I get to look at growing figs in cold climates, and today you'll hear a chat that I had over the weekend with Ross Raddy. Ross is a really inspiring 27-year-old backyard orchardist in the Philadelphia area, passionate about growing his own fruit and vegetables. Ross talks about what to do with fig trees at this time of year in cold climates, just as they start to come out of dormancy. I recommend you check out Ross's videos on YouTube. They're great. And you'll find him on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter where his handle is at Ross Raddy, R-O-S-S-R-A-D-D-I. Now, here's my chat with Ross. Hi, Ross. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me to talk about figs today. Oh, hey, Stephen. Thanks for having me again. It's really nice being on the show of yours. I really love being on the radio. It's just such a nice thing that you guys are doing. You and your daughter, Emma, are doing a great job. I just love all the inspiration that you guys are giving people, especially on figs. Well, thanks. We're we're having lots of fun with it. It's nice to hear that. Thank you. I have to ask you about the fig shuffle because I know that every year I think about taking my figs out and some years I've brought them out early and then we get a, a cold snap and I have to rush them back into the garage before it gets too cold and my neighbors must think I'm crazy because I, I'm moving these plants back and forth and I noticed on your blog you were talking about the fig shuffle. So tell me about what the fig shuffle means to you. <laughs> well, uh, the neighbors thinking you're crazy is probably you doing it right. But um, this fig shuffle is essentially, like you said, moving the pots around, moving the fig trees from wherever they're being protected, whether that's in your garage, maybe you have a root cellar, maybe you even have a greenhouse, and then you move them out into the sun, into warmer conditions, and the, the trees really heat up. And because they're getting that access to the heat, the metabolisms of the trees really start to get going. And they, they wake up, they put out leaves, and the growth is actually really strong depending on the amount of heat you can give them. Definitely suggest putting them in an area where there's a lot of thermal mass, maybe against your house, mm -hmm. on the patio, somewhere where you can really get that heat. And then if there's a frost that's going to come in, which you were also mentioning, you got to get them out of that way, the frost Keep them above 32 degrees. Also, definitely pay attention to the frost warnings on your weather forecast. And I would suggest if you don't want to have to maybe do the fig shuffle, you can maybe get away with it if you have them maybe in a microclimate in your yard that's perhaps a bit better, Right. maybe on higher ground. Um, also, you can get some plastic. Uh, you can put some plastic over them. Um, really cover the leaves if there is some leaves and hopefully if the temperatures are not too low, I would say maybe around maybe 25 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit to be safe. That's a really iffy temperature, but mm -hmm. if that frost comes in, at least the plastic is going to keep them protected. I also have friends that spray them before mm. they go to bed. They'll get their hose and they'll spray all their trees. It's what a lot of orchardists actually do in different crops. They'll, either use wind tunnels and they have these turbines in their orchard and they blow tons of wind on the plants and that really keeps that frost at bay or they will they will spray them all with water and okay. i think those are two really good methods otherwise you're going to be one of them crazy people that's shuffling <laughs> them back and forth <laughs> okay well so i know where you are in philadelphia area you're ahead of us it's it's warmer there than here in toronto where are your figs mm -hmm. at right now Right now, I'm seeing about four or five leaves on a lot of the trees that were dormant about a month ago. And we've tried to wake them up with the fig shuffle. We put them out, a lot of them, on the patio about April 1st. And here in my climate, the last frost is May 1st. So we put them out about a month early, 
mm-hmm. would say 15 to 30 days is pretty pretty safe. But again, you're pushing it. If you have a lot of pots, you don't have a good back. They're really heavy. It may not be something you want to do. But here in my climate, we've gotten away with this year. It's just been a phenomenal April. I cannot believe uh, all the stone fruits in the ground, as an example, woke up really early. They bloomed really early. And I thought, oh, no, we're going to get this frost that's going to come in and I'm going to have to protect everything. But even tonight, it's uh, it's actually really good. And we're almost at May 1st now. Uh, <laughs> Stephen, I don't know when this is going to air, but um, we are basically at this point away from all the frost. And like I said, three to five leaves on all the figs that were dormant. We have some in the pa- in the greenhouse that we've taken out of the greenhouse just this past weekend. We put them on the patio, adjusted them very slowly to the sun. Even though they're in the greenhouse and it's outside, that plastic is reducing that UV ray. So you have to really be careful, and you don't want to throw them in the full sun too soon. Right. So we've adjusted them, put them on the patio. And now they're, they're actually some of those that have been in the greenhouse. We woke those up sometime around mid-March. So they've been awake for a long time. And with the help of a heater in the greenhouse I turn on at night, keep those temperatures above 60, the trees are looking at, um, I would say, somewhere around eight or nine leaves per branch. So we're really far ahead of the season. I have actually main crop that's forming. I have a number of Breva that should be ripe maybe in about a month and a half. Wow. And I'm looking at main crop here. From the greenhouse trees, I would say August 1st, even for the very late varieties that I'm, I'm growing, which is exceptional. Uh, that's the goal every year, and I really figured out the greenhouse. You've got to tweak the numbers in there, really get things to the perfect condition for the optimal growth. Because you got to also get in there and water. You don't want to make things too hot or too dry. So I really made the numbers work out super well, and uh, everything is just really far ahead. Wow. So that sounds fantastic. You'll be having a a good early fig harvest. And meanwhile, I was driving through snow yesterday to go somewhere. So I have to say I'm pretty envious. I'm envious too. This is never going to happen again. Wow. I don't don't know. This is a really incredible April we've had. So I also want to get you to share just some of your top springtime tips as people are, are getting their figs ready for the season and they're coming out of dormancy. What are some of the top tips you share with people? You got it, Stephen. So the biggest tip is heat. If you don't get these trees out in a warm place, even your in-ground trees, say you live in a, in a, a warm pl- or you live in a cold place and you have some in-ground trees, move away that mulch. Get the ground really warm. Think of these things as if they are tropical and they really need that heat because most fig trees, they will grow some roots at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but really until it gets to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit at the root zone, we're talking about the temperature at the root zone, Mm -hmm. they don't really do a whole lot. So getting them that extra heat is really the best fertilizer. Mm. And it's not really a fertilizer, but (laughs) that's what I recommend to everybody. It's just warm things up. And I know that your climate can only give you so much, but you can really take advantage of that with different aspects of your yard. And, and the other things I would suggest is um, definitely give them some fertilizer first thing in the spring. Okay. That extra, for, that extra food's really going to get them to the, form those new leaves, those new branches. And that new growth is really, really important because the, the clock is ticking. For people that are like you and I who live in shorter season climates, I only have six months of frost-free days. I'm sure yours is even lower. Mm-hmm. So to get a fig tree to fruit in six months is quite a challenge. So what you need to do is feed them to get that new growth, and then sometime around June in my area or even July maybe in your area, you have to think about pinching. So pinching is going to remove that apical bud, induce those fruits, really tell the tree to say, hey, stop growing and let's put out some fruit. And what you need to do in the meantime is to focus on that growth. It's all leading up to June. It's all leading up to July because all that is going to really increase that productivity and inevitably your happiness. (laughs) Mm. So the other big tip is just water, and that's it. Okay. So heat, feed, pinch, and water then are some of the top tips. Those are the top tips for sure. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Ross. That. Those are great tips. 
I wish you a good fig harvest this season. Okay, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me, and good luck. I hope to see you guys uh, again soon. Maybe you should come down here and taste some figs in August. (laughs) I'd love that. That was a chat that I had with Ross Raddy, who's a fig expert in the Philadelphia area, and Ross was sharing his tips for fig trees at this time of year as they're starting to come out of dormancy. You can check out Ross's videos on YouTube. Just look for his name, Ross Raddy, R-A-D-D-I, and you'll find him on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter with the handle at Ross Raddy. And I should mention, too, that Ross joined us in a previous episode with lots of tips on figs and backyard fruit. And if you're interested in that, go to stephenbiggs.ca, past episodes of the radio show, and you can search for his name. Now, the Garage Gardeners radio show is just about over for today. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you'll join us again. Thanks to our guests for sharing their knowledge. Now, make sure to visit us on Instagram, where we hang out as the Garage Gardeners. And you can also find me at, on Instagram at the under the handle Emma Biggs underscore grows. And if you use Apple Podga- pa- Podcasts, make sure to subscribe. And if you like what we do, please rate and review us as well. Visit stephenbiggs.ca for fig growing tips, lemon growing ideas, and other ideas about cold climate growing. You're listening to the Garage Garden Nurse Radio Show. It's already episode 15. Thanks for listening. I'm Emma Biggs. And I'm Stephen Biggs. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for listening to the Garage Gardeners Radio Show with your hosts, Stephen and Emma Biggs, right here on Reality Radio 101.